mystery Death is beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive The empty cross, the empty grave Life eternal, you had won the day Shout it out, Jesus is alive He's alive To face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, perfect peace, only pain finally will see. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive.
and give him praise and thanks for those great things, shall we? Thank you, Lord Jesus. i 
from hell. Let me comfort those who suffer with the comfort you have given. I will tell of your great love for as long as I live. Singing what a faithful God have I. What a faithful God have I. What a faithful God. What a faithful God. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will fear no Yes, I can 
can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you. Still I will praise you. Sinning, oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go every high and every low. through the calm and through the storm and um, we're just going to hear from Paul quickly about a, a testimony of kind of facing fear um, and doing things that we can feel a bit com uh, uncomfortable doing um, so over to you Paul morning everyone um, I was just leaving this morning and um, outside next door is the man who his name's Tony he's the gardener he does a neighbour's garden but he does my garden as well which uh, is rather remarkable because he's 84, still working, just loves to be active. And he said to me, um, where are you going? I thought, oh, yeah, well, I know where I'm going, but what, what do I actually say? So I said, well, I'm going to church, actually. And you wait for the reaction. And he said, well, I don't go to church, so I'm not religious. And he said, it's, I think he said something like, it's full of strange people. I said, you, you don't need to be religious. Uh, so he sort of he, he concluded things by saying, would you say a prayer for me? I said, yes, of course they will. What would you like me to pray? And he said, will you pray that my wife is healed? His wife, Bernadette, um, suffers from, suffered from severe depression for many years. I think it was partly due to losing a, losing a child but uh, has, it seems almost like permanent depression and uh, hyper-anxiety. She sometimes phones you know, when he's actually at my place doing the garden. And um, so uh, I think he's notionally C of E, if, if that. What I'd like to do, just if we can, is just for, uh, just for a few moments, just pray that God will bring healing and even more salvation yeah. to Tony and Bernadette. He's one of these people, he's very happy-go-lucky. He never worries about anything. Well, that's great, as long as you actually know where you're going in life. Um, and he thinks church people are just religious. He doesn't, uh, what he needs to know is that it's actually, it's a relationship with God through Jesus. Can we pray, please? Tony yeah. and Bernadette. Yeah, shall we stand? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Heavenly yeah. Father, just oh, thank you thank that you. Um, you sit, your precious son, Jesus, as uh, the author and finisher of salvation, mm, who gave his life on a cross, you, Lord. Lord, that we might know um, uh, forgiveness, uh, redemption, and the assurance of salvation. And I just bring Tony um, and Bernadette to you. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God who heals, and ask Lord that you bring healing to her in mind and body. Uh, thank you, Lord, that because nothing is too difficult for you. Um, Lord, I ask more than that, that you would change the lives of this couple um, and bring salvation, bring faith, Lord, to them both. Yeah, yeah. Lord, now we, we can have a church background and yet Amen. we don't actually have, may not have faith because for whatever reason, Lord, thank you that you can break through that. And I ask, Lord, that you would just do that um, in, in Tony and in Bernadette. Lord, give them that understanding of the need for forgiveness 
that they will know your forgiveness, mm. that they may know, um, uh, come to know, Lord, the Jesus, Lord, who made it possible, Lord, through his uh, death and resurrection. Mm. Oh, Lord, please save and add them to your kingdom, yes, Lord, I ask, Lord, pray, yeah. that they may have the hope, Lord, uh, the certainty, mm. Lord, of knowing, Lord, a pro um, eternity, eternal life with you, yeah. Lord, in all its, um, all its perfection, in Thanks, Jesus, Jesus' name, yes. we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Um, yes, just off the back of that, guys, um, when we are, God is faithful when we step out, um, so we're going to send out the offering baskets now, um, so if you are new, just let it pass you by, um, and just remember, this is worship, oh, sorry, did you want to? Yeah, uh, th this is a part of our worship as well. So we're not just giving our, we're giving our money because this is, this is our worship. Um, so, yeah, did you want to quickly? Yeah. Sorry, just before the uh, offering comes around. Um, just on the back of what Paul said and what we were just singing, we were singing, no, you never let go. This morning we helped Zelda come to church and we're very, very pleased to see her here. Yes, we are. Um, but as we were coming out, her son Nick was pushing the wheelchair down the slope at the side of Zelda's house. And I heard him say, now I'm going to let go, <laughs> didn't he? Um, of course, we laughed because he wasn't going to let go. God doesn't let go of us. And we, we need to just stand and consider for a moment what would happen if he did let go of us. What would happen to us? But there's a world out there of people who don't know that God's got them. He's got them even though they don't believe it. And just like the couple next door to Paul, you know, we don't want them to feel that they've been let go, no. that nobody cares about them. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, reverse that round to the people you know that don't know that God's got hold of them and what their lives are like. Because if we contemplate what our life was like, if God let go of us, we can imagine where they're at. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. yeah aren't we privileged and lucky that salvation does not depend on us amen there's nothing we did to deserve it we just don't deserve it but God gives it freely anyway I sing the stand you stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do? But I felt his heart, oh God. So I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, my life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say?
His heart, O oh God, completely to You. What can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, O oh God, completely to you.
just been prompted to share this uh, just something that we probably many of us know already but um, Jesus spoke to his disciples and he and we are now his disciples aren't we and he gave us this command you must love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind now that's a challenge for us, isn't it? Because our minds and our hearts and our souls and we're all, we're pulled around every which way. But that's what he's commanded us to do. And that takes a bit of effort and it takes a bit of a focus. So I just want to remind us of that. And there's a battle going on, as we well know. You know, there's a battle for that love relationship because in and of ourselves, we don't have much love to give. We, we don't have any love to give. God is love, and he gives us love, and he's in us, and, and, and he flows through us. And it goes on from there, as many of you know, and it says the second is equally important, to love your neighbour as yourself. Now, if you are struggling to love yourself, to know love in your own heart that comes from God, I would love to pray for you. I would love to pray for you. The entire law and the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love your God. And love your neighbour. Yeah, let's just um, respond to that that Trace has just brought. We don't want to allow those moments of in insight from God to just pass us by. I was prompted to read this over us. So maybe if, if you can relate to what Trace has just said, if you just know, actually, I'm really struggling with myself in that sense. And um, I want to love the God, Lord, Lord God with all my heart, mind and soul. But I'm really struggling with that at the moment and strength. So this is the encouragement from the word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his might and power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, brothers and sisters, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Lord, I do pray right now for all the Lord's people that can hear me praying. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who are secure in who we are and whose we are. Lord, that we would know our identity is secure in you and in not what anybody else or anything else would say. And that, Jesus, that we would understand the reason you went to the cross was to reconcile us 
failed humans, full of sin, and yet you reconciled us so that we can be loved by the Father, that we can call out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he doesn't just turn around and go, what do you want, subject? He welcomes us as friends. He welcomes us as brothers and sisters. And Jesus, we thank you for the identity that we have in you, that you've clothed us with righteousness, that you have removed from us our sins as far as the east is from the west. And I pray, Lord, that we would learn what it is to look at one another with the same eyes that you look at us, Jesus, with grace, compassion, love, and kindness, Lord, that we would be a people that model something different to a world that is desperately seeking something. They don't know what they're seeking. They're definitely seeking something. They're seeking affirmation and and security and identity and all kinds of things. But Jesus, we know you're the only true rock on which we can stand. We thank you, Lord. Lord, I bless those this morning that you've been speaking to through our time of worship. Father, we pray that you continue to speak to us as we turn to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before I say anything, I'm just going to ask Megs to come up. Thank you, Ben. You served us really well this morning. Bless you. Good morning, church. Um, If you don't know me, my name's Megan. I'm I'm staff here at um, New Life. Um, And I just want to quickly just just ask two questions. So if you could just raise a hand if you like food. Yeah. And then could you raise a hand if you like hosting or hospitality? less (laughs) less <laughs> but most people put their hand up in one of those questions so this is an event for you so we are hosting another come dine with me yeah thank you um <laughs> so last time we did a come dine with me it was an evening event um on a saturday i think yes thanks trace um and we went to each other's houses um and shared um food together well this time we're doing an all-age sunday lunch edition um so it means if you've got kids teenagers, um, whether you don't um, and you just fancy a Sunday lunch, um, this is an event for you. So um, we'll be over there again um, after church with um, sign-up sheets. Um, But it's basically if you'd like to host or if you'd like to go to somebody's house for a Sunday lunch, then just sign up for this. It's on the 23rd of June at 2pm. And it's free food, guys. So... What more could you want? Um, so yeah, we'd love we'd love this opportunity to just be a time where you can get to know um, the other people in the family of God, um, where you can fellowship over food, um, where you can host if that's something that you love to do. You can invite people into your homes. Um, there's opportunity to be really specific with your dietary needs. Please don't see that as a restriction. Um, there's even opportunity to say things like. I don't like dogs, so please don't send me to a house of dogs. Or, I love dogs, so send me there. Um, So there's lots of opportunity. It's open for everybody. um, And we really take time to sit and think about who should go where. Um, So don't worry, we won't just, like, send you by yourself into the middle of nowhere. Um, So, yeah, please, please, please come and sign up to this. Lifts are not a restriction. Dietary requirements are not a restriction. Kids are not a restriction. So please, please, please come and sign up today. Brilliant. Thanks, Megs. Excellent. Brilliant event. Um, This yesterday, a number of us were in Birmingham. I just offended a whole bunch of Midlanders. Um, But we were in Birmingham for a preachers and teachers training day. Um, And we were in a building um, in West Bromwich that God has just given to us as a movement of churches. I mean... That in itself is pretty awesome, isn't it? So he was like, um, through the favor of God, he's been, this building has been given to a couple who have said, we want to start a church in West Bromwich. And there was a church that has this building, but are struggling really to find momentum. And they said, well, look, you can have our building free of charge if you would like and start a church in West Bromwich. And we've been singing this morning a lot about the faithfulness of God. Um, and then this couple get up and start to just share this last one year of their lives with us you know so they're standing there saying we're we're about to plant a church in West Bromwich this is the building thanks for coming and being here um and then the person told them said well tell us a bit about what happened this last year and I kid you not the list of of just like the painful things they've been through 
you know, we've just sung about the faithfulness of God. And they're going, we moved, my dad died. And then our car got stolen. And then our new car got broken into. And then there's a land dispute with our neighbours. And they just went on and on and on and on. They're going, and we're so excited that God's on the move. And you go, oh. And it's just, you know, you hear stories like that about what's going on outside of our community. I love our community. You know that, church. But when you hear stories like that as well, it builds your faith. And next week, next Saturday at 2.30, we're meeting with a whole bunch of our other churches that are part of our family in New Life Croydon, not New Life Biggin Hill. I wonder how many are going to turn up here next Saturday. It'll be interesting to see. But uh, New Life Croydon, where we're going to gather together with a couple of hundred other church, uh, not churches, but people from other churches of regions beyond within London for a time of celebration and a time of hearing stories about what God's doing on our doorstep. A time of hearing stories about what God's doing in London, in the city of London, in the surrounding areas. It's a completely free event. There's no cost. It's right on the tram line. It's easy to get to. And I want to encourage you, please, whatever excuse you've got for not going, ask yourself, is it a genuine excuse? Or is it because you just don't like Croydon? I had a lovely conversation with someone earlier on that was like, do you know what, but Croydon's rough, in it? And I was like, yeah, maybe Jesus is going to call you there. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> so please do come if you're available next Saturday. It's only for a couple of hours, and we're doing um, kids ministry and youth ministry the whole time. Um, if you've not got one of these, can you just pop your hand up? And if you don't know what it is, just put your hand up. That'd be great. Here we go, my beautiful assistants, Callum and Ollie. Go for it. As a leadership team... And as a church, we believe nothing decent happens without prayer. Amen? And we recognize that in our youth and our young people, there is a battle taking place right now for their very souls. I don't want to be overdramatic, but that's what's happening. You look at the society, you look at the world, and it is a battle. So as a leadership team, along with the wonderful James and Lois, who lead our youth team, we've covenanted, we've promised... That as a team and as a church, we are going to pray on Fridays specifically for our youth. You don't have to leave your house. But if you want to, Carol's leading a little prayer group during youth group in the upper, upper room. It sounds so spiritual. Um, in the lounge. In the church office. So, there, but, so if you want to physically come and pray for our youth. But would you take one of these? It just gives you some pointers to pray for our young people. We're calling it Friday Focus. I believe as we pray we will see God break through. As we pray, our young people will know the blessing and the, the heart of God for them. And unless we pray, we've got no excuses, eh? So please pray. And if you haven't got one of these, these guys should have given them all out now. Um, stick it on your um, something where you're going to see it. Your mirror. Today, you see, everyone's thinking fridge. I'm trying to think outside the box. Stick it on your bedroom, bathroom mirror when you're brushing your teeth on a Friday morning and you can pray. It's not a bad idea, is it? Um, guys, this morning we've got Jordan bringing the word to us. Can we just pray for Jordan? I'm just going to pray for Jordan. Come up here, Jordan. Oh, look, you're getting a little clap. You haven't even said anything. <laughs> for those that don't know, Jordan and Becca are leaving us. Um, on the 31st of August is their last official um, payday and then they're going to be with us on the 8th of September will be their last Sunday morning with us and we are looking forward to having a real wonderful morning of celebration we'll eat together afterwards so 8th of September put that in your diary Um, I'm so proud of how these guys have navigated these last few years and they have um, epitomise what it is to be faithful when God calls you. Even they were willing to go anywhere, and they've ended up in Thornton Heath. Um, so <laughs> praise God. Uh, but they're with us for the next couple of months, and it's a real privilege to have you preaching, George. Let's just pray for you, Father. We want to thank you for um, the many gifts that you've given to this church. We thank you for Becca. We thank you for Jordan. Lord, we thank you for the blessing they've been, and we believe will continue to be to us as a church and as a wider movement. And Lord, we just want to commit this next half an hour or so to you, Jesus ask that you would speak to us through Jordan's preparation and through your word that we would have ears to hear um, hearts to receive and minds to understand Lord the mysteries of your word and that they would come alive to us and change us and shape us as we move forward into this coming uh, week months and years in Jesus name amen. amen
Am I on? Hello. Hello. Yes. By the way, Thornton Heath, <coughs> Thornton Heath is in North Croydon. So, if you um. Two seconds. Who's Russell? Okay. Is that better? There we go. So, yes, Thornton Heath is in North Croydon. So don't not Croydon until you've tried it. Um, not that I ever thought I'd be in Croydon, that's fair to say. Um, but we're going to be, so looking forward to that. And I'm not on a poaching mission, but I am. If you want to come with us, Amen. talk to me. Um, we'd love to have you, because I'm going to need some help. So um, let me know. So... As Simon said, I'm Jordan, this is my wife Becca, um, and it's a privilege to be on staff here at New Life in this season and also serve this church on the leadership team. Um, and these past few weeks, we've been going through this discipleship series, and we've been looking at different disciple, uh, discipleship relationships uh, and people throughout the Bible. Last week was Jonathan and the armor bearer, um, and we've looked at other relationships too. And Simon took us last week um, through how, as Christians, we are to have each other's backs, and we're to be there for each other, even in the the fight, even in the battles, even in the, the ups and downs of life. We're to look out for one another. And this week, we're going to look at another relationship. We're going to look at Paul and Timothy. Um, so I want to look at a few aspects of their relationship this morning and what it means for us um, for, uh, as disciples and also as those who disciple others. Um, so we're going to look at their relationship we're going to look at how Paul equips Timothy, and we're going to look at Paul's advocacy of Timothy. But first, what do we know about Timothy, and what do we know about Paul? So, Timothy was a young man who began travelling with Paul and with Silas when they visited Lystra during the second missionary journey. And we read about this in Acts chapter 16. Timothy's mother was Jewish, but his father was Greek. So he hadn't been circumcised, even though he had been raised to know and honour God. And that's just not a random flippant comment. It's important why he wasn't, because later he decided to be. Timothy's commitment to the Lord is so strong that we read later he allows himself to be circumcised in order not to offend the religious Jews that he would encounter. And again, we read about that in Acts chapter 16. And Paul, most of us if you've been in church for a while, we'll know about Paul. You'll know about that he used to be called Saul. He was born to Jewish parents but was a Roman citizen. He grew up in Jerusalem and he studied the Hebrew scriptures under a famous rabbi. He was probably a Pharisee, but he was a zealous persecutor of the church. He arrested Christians, he was involved in the trial of Christians, and possibly even in the execution of Christians. We read in Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen, uh, and it's likely that Paul was part of that whole, if not part of the, um, the, the trial that judged him to be stoned, or sentenced him to be stoned, he was there for the stoning, and probably encouraging it. Yet... While he's on the road to Damascus to persecute yet more Christians, the glorified Jesus appears to him and he is converted and he goes from persecutor to follower. And Paul met Timothy, um, as I said, whilst he was travelling tra tra through Lystra and discovered that Timothy was the son of a believing Jewish mother and a Greek father and that people spoke highly of him. So we're going to look at number one. We're going to look at their relationship. Um, good place to start would probably be Paul's first letter to Timothy. And his greeting to Timothy could sum up their whole relationship in one sentence. He says, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. And his second letter says, my beloved child. Paul clearly sees Timothy as a son. Not biological, but spiritual. He was invested in Timothy. He had invested his own faith, his own life, his own ministry, and invested in Timothy's life, in Timothy's faith, and in Timothy's ministry. And as Simon was preaching to us last week, it's so important that we, ha we each have an armour-bearer, and that we are an armour-bearer 
for others, that we are being discipled and that we are discipling others. We all need spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers, even if you're in your 80s or if you're in your 8s, you are in need of a spiritual mother or a father or both. We all need someone who is speaking into our lives. And that is a couple of steps uh, beyond us in their journey of faith. Someone we can go to with these questions, with the questions that we inevitably have about life and about faith. Those that have gone before us and have probably made the mistakes that we've already made. And they can help us try not to make too many more in the future. Proverbs 11 says, Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counsellors, there is safety. The Bible tells us it's wise to take counsel. And that, isn't, and that is wise to take counsel from different sources. And that's not so if I go to Malcolm for some advice and I don't like his advice, I go to Simon, or and I don't like his advice, I then go to Rob. It's that we have many different gifts and many different life experiences that speak into our own lives and they help us grow and they help us mature uh, in our faith. And I've been blessed over the years and, and even now to have a number of spiritual fathers and mothers in my life. They, they care for me. They care for my life. They care for my walk with God and my marriage. They, they, they want to they see me flourish in my faith and what God has called me to do. And we each need this input and we each need to be inputting um, to others. And you don't have to be working in ministry to be discipled. Yeah. Just, because, just because I'm full-time at the church doesn't mean that I'm... That I, I get special discipleship or I get a special level of discipleship. We can all be discipled and we all should be discipled. Whether you work in a church, whether you work in an office or a school, a factory, we must all be discipled and be discipling. And this discipleship relationship, as we've seen already um, with Paul and Timothy, how Paul describes Timothy, it's a special one. It's a relationship that um, you can be in a position to share your life with this brother or sister or father or mother, however, uncle and auntie, however you see them in the Lord. And you can share your worries, you can share your joys, your strengths, your weaknesses, and you can know that you're in a safe environment to share these things. This person only wants the best for you. That's how the relationship should work. And if it's not a it's not necessarily going to be a close relationship at the very start, but it should develop into one as you share your lives together. And in order to, uh, because discipleship isn't done at arm's length, it's a close relationship. We chat together, we have coffee together, we eat together, we do life together, we are in each other's lives. And the Bible calls on us to confess to one another, to bear one another's burdens, to love and to pray for one another. Build up and encourage one another. There are so many one another's in the Bible. And this relationship between Paul and Timothy is shown like this in a few ways. Paul takes an active role in Timothy's spiritual training and his development. So when we disciple someone, we must care for their growth. If we're spending time with other Christians, especially those that are further along than us, and you're not maturing, something is wrong. Over time, we should see fruit. We should, we should bear fruit. And the, the life of us and the life of the person discipling us or who we are discipling should be changed in time through the word, through prayer, through the mentorship of a mature believer. Yeah. And their co-workers in, in ministry, Paul, um, Paul often says about uh, Timothy that he's my co-laborer. In Christ, He's, you know, they, they do things together. It's not Paul and Timothy. It's Paul and Timothy. They're doing things together um, for Jesus. And Timothy accompanies Paul on his missionary journey, helps him establish churches. And Timothy is mentioned as co-author on some of Paul's letters. That doesn't necessarily mean that Paul wrote half and Timothy wrote half. But because they're doing this together, the things that Paul is writing about, they've done together... They, are, they have co-authored the very things that have happened 
along with, with God to these churches. So 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and, and I never know how to say this one, Philemon, 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 there we go, is, they're all, um, Paul says these are all co-authored by Timothy. Indicates this close working relationship that they have. You and that person you disciple, you may not go travelling to churches and uh, be involved in raising leaders or strengthening churches or anything like that, but you are still called as disciples to make disciples of all nations. You're still called to love each other, you're still called to pray together and read the scriptures together. And in his letters to Timothy, Paul provides extensive encouragement and practical advice. Paul's letters have personal encouragement, exhortations. They reflect um, his deep care for Timothy's spiritual well-being and his ministry success. His, his life, you know, for, for Timothy, his job was ministry. Your job may be in an office working for an insurance company like I used to. It's, you know, that you're the person who disciples you has, should have a care for your success, not so you become rich and make loads of money, but that, that you are successful in your life and what you're doing for, for Jesus. And we can never underestimate the value of encouragement. Encouragement often comes exactly when we need it. Have you noticed that? So, and I'm, I'm thankful to be, in, uh, to be part of a church that, is, that has so many encouragers. And they always come at the right time. You know, you're having that, that bad day where you think, oh, no, I've, I, I don't feel good. I don't feel like I'm, I should be doing what I'm doing. I, I, just, I, I just don't feel, I just feel a bit, Ugh, and I just don't think I should carry on with what I'm doing or I'm questioning this or questioning that. And that word of encouragement comes at exactly the right time. And it lifts you and it spurs you to carry on doing what you're doing. And what this relationship we see between Paul and Timothy, it's like model discipleship, right? It's, uh, you know, Jesus and his disciples, that's the model, right? But we see uh, a, more, a more practical working out in the day-to-day of church life with Paul and Timothy. And this becomes a model for us. Paul's investment in Timothy demonstrates the importance of mentoring, of training, and equipping disciples. Because if we don't equip disciples, we don't share the gospel if we don't equip disciples we don't have church leaders if we don't equip disciples you know the church dies we have to you know disciples preach the gospel and make more disciples that go make more disciples that go and preach the gospel and make more disciples and it keeps on going like that until Jesus comes again so our common goal as disciples and those who disciple is to see the name of Jesus spread and the gospel reach the ends of the earth. And there's this affection and loyalty between Paul and Timothy. We've already heard it. My son, my beloved son. And it's, it's evident throughout the New Testament. And Paul talks in Philippians chapter 2. He says, I have no one else like him, speaking of Timothy, who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. The church sticks together. We're the only family, group, organisation, whatever you want to call us, on the planet that actually has something to die for. Right? We are loyal to each other and we are loyal to God because he was first loyal to us. And we have this affection and this love for each other and it flows out of what we've received by God. We, are, you know, we love because he first loved us. We can, we can only pour out because we have been poured into. And it's a love that sends a willing Jesus to the cross to die for you and to die for me. For sins he did not commit, for a punishment he did not deserve... Yet we get to live in the fruit and the good of this glorious death and resurrection. And the relationship between Paul and Timothy is marked with respect, deep affection, and this shared commitment to the gospel. And this is where we read Paul starts to equip Timothy. In reading Paul's many writings in the New Testament, we read that Paul equips Timothy theologically, He equips him relationally, and he equips him missionally. 
In his second letter to Timothy, Paul encourages Timothy to follow the pattern of words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul has poured his own learning into Timothy. He himself, Paul, has studied the scriptures for years and he implores his spiritual son to carry on doing the same. And this is so important. If the person discipling you doesn't make you want to read the Bible more, there's an issue. If we spend time with someone who is meant to be discipling us and it doesn't make us want to read the Bible more, something is wrong. We should be encouraging each other from the word. With our testimonies, as we share our struggles, it should lead us to pray. It should lead us to seek God more. It should lead us to the Bible to say, this is what God says when you're struggling with this. This is what God says when this is going on. Paul often writes to Timothy of what he is struggling with and the struggles of the church he is overseeing and sending Timothy to help. When we hear of someone struggling, whether it's health, whether it's work, it should stir us to pray. It should stir us to read our Bibles and send an encouraging passage to them. How many times have you received that? A prayer goes out on the prayer chain and it's, please pray for this. And you you get a message that says, I've just been praying for you and I feel this passage. Or I've just been praying for you and I feel God would say this. Or I've just been, you know, even a message that says, I've been praying for you, that... You know, with all, all this stuff that's been going on with, um, our, you know, are we going over to Thornton Heath, are we not? What are we doing up and down, left and right? Uh, it's, it's amazing when you hear, oh, I've been praying for you. And I'm like, oh, you forget how many saints across the world are, are praying for you. There are, there are people right now in Pakistan that are praying for us. There are people right now in Australia although they probably haven't met yet, are praying, well, they have met, they're ahead of us, aren't they, who, who have prayed for us in America, in Europe. In, so they're praying for us, they're praying for you, and that should stir us um, to then pray for others. Those who we are discipling and those who disciple us should motivate us in the things of God. It should want us, you know, sometimes, you know, when you feel really encouraged, I feel, oh, I could run through a wall. You know, I just, I just, you know, you feel encouraged, and that's how we should make each other. Don't actually run through walls, please. Um, and what it was, it was interesting that um, on a big small group on Wednesday, um, Nick Causley was sharing a story about his dad, um, and his dad was high up at um, RSA, at an insurance company, and he was a Christian, but no one in the office was, and he didn't particularly evangelise. He just lived as a disciple of Jesus. If they asked, he would answer. You know, what do you believe? Well, this is what I believe. Or, you know, why do you do this? Or this is why I do this. But in the time from when he got there and from from when he left, the vast majority of of this office had come to Christ. And not necessarily because he'd been, you know, on the soapbox every day at lunch, but that this gentle uh, living as a disciple of Jesus, you know, seeped into the environment and seeped into the hearts of those um, that he was around. And often we are discipling people without even knowing we're discipling people. What, how we act in front of others, how we, and I'm, this is a thing I'm really preaching to myself, how, how we act in front of others when we maybe don't know people are looking, um, you know, when we're talking to our spouses or we're talking to someone else in the church, in the room, people are looking at us. And that's not to make you self-conscious, that's to, that's to make you think, I've got to check myself. Um, and I'm, I, I'm pre- um, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm first preaching to myself. We've got to, we've got to check ourselves in those um, circumstances. And Timothy would have watched Paul over the years. There was a lot that would have been, you know, a lot of discipling coming from Paul that would have been silent. It would have been Timothy watching Paul and seeing how he led a meeting or seeing how he dealt with a widow or dealt with a, a, gr- a grieving mother. And that's picked up almost subconsciously. But it's also likely that Paul taught Timothy everything he knew regarding the scriptures. And we have this this idea, this thought that um, the Pharisees, Paul was likely a Pharisee, that the Pharisees had to know the first five books of the Old Testament by heart. So Paul knew his scriptures. So we can assume that he's poured this wealth of of knowledge into Timothy. 
teaches Timothy about sound doctrine. Paul emphasizes the important the importance of maintaining sound doctrine and, uh, and avoiding <coughs> false teachers. So 1 Timothy especially is about, is saying to Timothy, right, when you go to this church, this and this is happening, sort it out. This is, this is what is being taught and believed, but this is what should be taught and should be um, believed. He emphasizes the value of scripture for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness. That's a whole sermon in itself, right? That one verse is a whole sermon in itself. But Paul is distilling these foundational truths in Timothy. And that's what we should do within our discipleship. We should be distilling the, the truth of Scripture. You know, I've had conversations with people that I've discipled where um, they'll say, oh, we're reading this, and uh, I think it means this. And you think, whoa, that's, you know... I don't know what, where you got that from, but that's either weird or wacky or whatever. And then you, you, then you come in and you say, well, you open the scripture and you distill the, the truth of scripture and what, and what it's actually saying and what, and what God is actually saying. And that's important in our, in our discipleship context. Paul talks about qualif- qualifications for leaders. But qualifications for leaders, if you read them, is actually just a qualification for a Christian. It's not, ev- it's not a, you know, only, cri- only elders have to be you know, not drunks and have one wife and, and these sorts of things. That's, that's a normal um, thing for Christians to just stick to. Um, but what, what, Paul is, what Paul is doing is he's sending Timothy to the church in F- Ephesus to combat false teaching and to establish this healthy leadership. So, and again, when a disciple watches what their discipler is doing, they, it happens almost by osmosis. So if the leadership, what Paul is saying, if the leadership is healthy, the church will be healthy. Because the leadership is teaching what is right, the leadership is doing what is right, they're discipling their congregation in the right way, and then church should follow. Yeah. And that comes to God, godliness and holiness. Paul instructs Timothy to pursue righteousness. It's not just think about it, pray about it, it might happen. Pursue it, wholeheartedly pursue righteousness and godliness, faith and love, endurance and gentleness. Paul knows that these fruits of the Spirit will grow as he presses into God. Um, Yeah, I've got time, for sorry. So my best friend, Jim, he'll probably listen to this. Hi, Jim. Um, uh, I remember once saying to him, oh, just... We were talking about something. I won't say what it is if I remember because it might put me in a bad light. But I said, um, I said, I just I don't have any patience for that. Don't have any patience for that. He said, you do have patience. I said, no, I don't have patience for that, Jim. He said, no, it's one of the fruits of the spirit. You have patience, you just don't have a lot of it. <laughs> right? So, so but as you, as you press into God, as you press into the word, as you pray more, these fruits of the spirit, they increase. You, you grow in patience. So you have patience, but it might just be low, and you need to work on getting more patience. Um, so thanks for that, Jim, because I've now told that uh, as a story. So there we go. How's it going? Right. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I still need more. I still need more of all the spiritual gifts. <laughs> Gentleness, self-control, all of these things. Okay. Yeah. So Timothy is urged to devote himself. I'm going to use self-control and carry on in my notes. So Timothy is urged to devote himself to the public reading of Scripture, preaching and teaching. Paul is encouraging Timothy to teach Scriptures regularly and wholeheartedly. And again, that happens from the front. It happens in the back. Um, We go on and do this. And this is where Paul brings this famous verse. Let no one despise you for your youth. This came in the prayer meeting this morning. We were talking about it. But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Paul's saying, look, Tim, your your age doesn't matter. Right? You can have someone who is 80 and been a Christian for... 70 years and be less mature than someone who's been a Christian for a year, right? So Paul also says, don't let new believers become elders, right? That's probably not a good idea. Um, but he's, he, what he's saying is you will show your maturity, not through your age, but your actions. You will show your maturity through how you lead God's people, um, and that's something I'm taking in at the moment. Uh, as Simon says, we're... Um, we're going to be moving to Fortin Heath, 
Um, and John Cleveley, hi John, you might watch this as well. Um, they've, already, they've already voted me in, so you can't come back now, so uh, it's fine. Um, <laughs> But John is retiring, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be going in to lead the church. And I've never led a church before. Um, all the elders, the two of the elders are 10 years older than me. The other two elders are, uh, I'm going to get this right, John, are 30 odd years older than me. So I'm going in as the youngest, but I've really, I've really been trying to concentrate on what Paul is saying here and saying, your age doesn't matter. And I'm not necessarily saying I'm more spiritually mature than all of these guys. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that. But God has called me to a task. And I've got to, got to do that task and trust that God is giving me the, uh, the, the skills and the equipping and the calling and the maturity to, to do that task. Um, so Paul talks about handling opposition. He, em- he advises Timothy on how to deal with false teachers. And again, we can do that in our discipleship, how we have um, conversations with each other. He says, do your best to present yourself as one approved. So what we've just been saying, these false teachers were thinking, who's this young kid? He doesn't know anything. But he says, again, through your actions, you prove yourself as one approved by God um, to bring this teaching. And also, he talks about the centrality of Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, the core sorry, of Paul's message is Christ only for salvation, emphasising his death, his resurrection, and the hope of eternal life. Paul talks about his life. He said, I was a blasphemer. I used to arrest and even kill Christians, and I was stuck in my unbelief, Paul says. But, and we are in the same condition we are in the same you know pre-saved we are in the same human condition we're stuck in our unbelief we're blasphemers might not necessarily use the lord's name in vain but you know we might swear we just do things against god that's how we are um but and we we only strive for our own success on our own pleasure but and paul likes a, to put a but in his letters doesn't he paul says the grace of our lord overflowed me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Even as we're stuck in our sin, God chooses to overflow us with faith and love that's only found in Jesus. We are given this gift of faith. Faith that hears the gospel, hears that Jesus, the Son of God, is sent to earth to live a perfect life that I couldn't, to fulfill a law that I couldn't, to die a death that I deserve and pays the penalty... For, uh, for not the sin that he committed, but for the sin that I have committed. So that death now, we've been singing, death now has no sting, it has no victory. Those who believe in this gospel, no, de- no sting in death, no victory in death for death. Victory is ours in death through Jesus. All of this so that Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe. So when I don't have any patience, I look at Jesus' perfect example of patience. Paul talks about patient, uh, faith sorry, and good, con- uh, good conscience. And we're privileged here to sit under a wealth of teaching, but also in our wider family of churches. We can lean into what's being taught as trustworthy. Many of us have received words from God and we are to lean into these when doubt comes. Becca and I, if you don't know, it was about six months ago or so, we moved back from a couple of years in South Africa serving uh, one of our churches in our family. So, I mean, a few hours ago, Dick LeBeng Church would have been praying for us. Um, that's another example of our extended family. And there were times where we, you know, we're away from home, we're away from family, we're having pastoral issues or we're having relational issues or whatever and you might think oh was all of this worth it was moving halfway across the world was this worth it are we are we really doing what God wants us to do 
And, but then we, what we do is we lean into what we have been taught. We lean into what God has, has said about us in the Bible. We lean into the words that have come um, from God about this time um, in, in South Africa. And God was right. Of course he was right. We enjoyed our time out there immensely, and we wouldn't change it for anything. But it's important to remember that Scripture is full of promises. It's full of promises for any situation that you may find yourself in. And that helps us as disciplers and disciples. You know, when, when someone you're discipling comes to you and says, I'm just really struggling with this, you know, well, God says this. We don't, and we don't have to have it all in the memory bank. You know, Google's pretty good for things like that, right? And, and it, that doesn't cheapen what you're bringing to them, you know, because it's truth coming from the Bible, you know? Um, so we, we use these in our discipleship, um, discipleship situations. And Timothy reminds us to fan into flame spiritual gifts. And that's important within our discipleship, is to, is to find those spiritual gifts uh, that you each have and to encourage them in that, to encourage them, hey, that was a really good prayer you prayed out, or that was a really good word of encouragement. Or, and then that encourages them to, to go on. Okay. So Paul was also Timothy's advocate. This is where I'm going to... Um, I'm not going to say come into land. Um, this is where it's... I'm not going to say finally either. I'm going to finish with, with this bit. Um, Paul was also Timothy's advocate. So we only see what Paul writes about Timothy in his letters, but we can be confident Paul speaks highly of Timothy away from the pen and paper. And I can speak from experience that one of the biggest encouragement, encouragements is to have someone who advocates for you, who you know has your back and encourages, encourages you along the way. However, and I found this out, a little while ago, is that encouragement is not always praise. In discipleship, we are often admonished, we are lovingly corrected, and it's often painful. I've lost count the number of times that I've been admonished and corrected. It's been a busy week. It has. (laughs) Both both, both lovingly uh, and seriously, Um, because there's sometimes a need for that. You don't want to be told that you've done something wrong. You don't want to be wrong. That's maybe just me. I don't like being wrong, right? And that's, that's, my, that's my flesh. Um, but I take great comfort in Jesus' words in John 15. He talks about how he's the true vine and that we must be grafted in him. We must abide in him in order to bear fruit. That without being grafted into uh, the true vine, we don't bear fruit. But... We're told that those who bear fruit, those who are doing well, get pruned. And that means if we don't have this pruning, this cutting back of what is dead, we won't grow more fruit. There won't be growth. All you green-thumbed people out there, I'm not green-thumbed at all, but you'll know that when you go in the garden, when you see something, a rose bush, for example, and you think, well, that needs cutting back or it won't grow. Um, so I take, great, I take great comfort in that, and, and, and so must you. Um, and these past few years here on, uh, on staff, and also in South Africa, have been an intense time of pruning. It really has. And, o- and often it's hurt. But all this pruning by God and this discipleship has been invaluable. And as many of you... Um, I've already said this. It's fine. I said it at the beginning. So we're, going to, we're, we're moving on to, uh, to, to Buda Family Church in uh, September. And uh, the last week, Sunday, they didn't, I was only jesting when I said voting, they don't technically vote, but they just ask if the church are behind um, this move um, and this change and transition in leadership, and they were unanimously, thank you, um, thank, uh, thanks to God for that, um, but um, none of us are or ever will be the finished article. There were always, to the day that I die, I'm sure there's going to be pruning, um, Definitely, and and I and part of part of what helps helps me keep um, knowing that is that is the mammoth task that's ahead, and I think that's that's what we have as a church as well. We we look at the world, especially with our youth at the moment. We've been talking about praying. Is that we look at the world and we think that is a mammoth task <gasps> to bring to bring. I know it's not a mammoth task for God, but we look at it and we say that's a mammoth. Bring in these strongholds of you know identity and bring in these strongholds of of sexual uh, sin and sexuality and all these things, and, and looking at all that and thinking, that's too big for me. I, I, I look at this church and I think, 
I have no idea what to do. And that's me being very honest. And I think that's a mammoth task for me. But thankfully, we, we stand with a God behind us that knows exactly what to do. And that task is not mammoth for him. So, so Paul shows this advocacy for Timothy. He is behind, he commends Timothy publicly. Um, he says he has, like we've said, no one like him. And we should do that with our, the people we disciple, those we sit with. We should encourage them, speak highly of them. You know, oh, you know what, Malcolm's really good at this. He's really good at praying out. He's really good at that. Or Ben, Ben led the service really well. Well done. And we call out that gold in, those, in, in the people we disciple, and that encourages them, that spurs them to go on and do more. <laughs> And as, we, as we're spurred on, as we go and do more, as we achieve more for God, God, God likes to then pile on more things and more responsibility um, because he knows as we grow, we can handle these things. And the, you know, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So as we are Im- imitating our, the person who's discipling us, we know they're imitating Christ and we go on. And then we're, you know, pe- we made that man... That, that may mean then that more people come to us for discipleship because we are growing and we are imitating Christ and they want to imitate us as we imitate Christ. So we see Paul. Um, could the band come up? I think we'll respond. Thank you. Um, we see Paul lay down these foundations for Timothy, this discipleship model that we see and these foundations of leadership, discipleship, handing of the word, dealing with church conflict. All those things aren't just between, you know, church leadership discipleships. We can take uh, a lot from all of um, this stuff. And that's what discipleship is. It's ensuring that those you are discipling receive a foundation in which to build their faith. They receive a uh, a grounding in which to continue their walk with God. And as you disciple, you learn. You are blessed by what you pour into others and seeing that person maturing. That encourages you when you spend time with someone and you see them um, maturing, you see them encouraging others, you see them change, that encourages you and that builds you up more to go on and keep doing that. So I want to take this opportunity as we go to the band and respond to call on the Paul and the Timothys in the room. Do you feel a desire to disciple others? Has God placed on your heart certain people or things that you would love to impart to others? Or do you long to be discipled? You long for an older brother or an older sister, a father or a mother in the faith to come alongside you and help you grow? As the band play, as we respond... um, There's a bit of space back there. I think we had a ministry space back there last week. I think if if that's you, if you're a Paul uh, or you feel like a Timothy, um, some of the leadership team will go back there um, and also maybe a couple of the small group leaders. And we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to, and maybe as Paul and Timothy's come up, we can can pair you together um, in in discipleship. And also if you're you're here this morning and you're hearing this this gospel, you're hearing this relationship um, that we're modelling, um, this, uh, this morning and you think I want to know more about that I want to know, you know why we're so committed to being like this Jesus why we want to imitate this uh, Jewish man from 2,000 years ago so much then come and see one of us someone in an orange lanyard someone who's milling here up the front and we'd love to talk to you about who Jesus is and share more about you with him thanks Isaac shall we stand My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I 
dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name Christ
for the gift of discipleship. We thank you that you have called us to make disciples. And Lord, we we ask that you help us to do that. We ask that you help us to have the right attitude to to be ready to be pruned back when we need to be. Father, I ask that you you give us, put people on our hearts, Father, to, to speak to. Even this week, Lord, we ask that you raise people that we can get around and encourage. Father, we ask that you help us in our conversations, in our actions. Lord, just help us to be more like you. Help us to be more like Jesus, the ultimate discipler. So, Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together this morning. And we ask that you help us as we leave this place to go, to go and make disciples. We ask that in your mighty name. Amen. Um, we're going to draw our meeting to an end there, guys. Ooh, thank you. Um, please don't forget to sign up to come dine with me, guys. Um, but, yeah, have a great rest of your weekend, um, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>